we're all here. I guess we can get rolling. Um, so, so welcome everybody to the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center's webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be seeing the House of the Cylinder Jars, Room 28 in Pueblo Benito, Chaco Canyon. Uh, to give you a little synopsis here, in 1896, excavations in Room 28 in Pueblo Benito made several extraordinary finds. 173 whole ceramic vessels, including 112 Chaco cylinder jars, as well as hundreds of ornaments and copper objects. After discovering residues of cacao in cylinder jars in 2009, Dr. Patricia Crown, who's joining us today, supervised the re-excavation of Room 28 in 2013 to examine the stratigraphy, collect datable materials, and determine when and why the room burned. In this talk, uh, Dr. Crown will describe the results of this re-excavation, which helps us understand how the jars were used in the cacao drinking ritual and why the room was set on fire. Surprisingly, the room had been filled with back dirt from surrounding rooms, giving additional information on the area of Pueblo Benito, nor known as the Northern Burial Cluster. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickoria Apache, people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission-related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Now the mission of Crow Canyon uh, is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. If you wanna find out a little bit more about us and what we do, some of our upcoming programming, uh, and there's some educational materials there as well, you can head on over to our website, uh, www.crowcanyon.org. Now, at this point in the game, I'm guessing most of us have uh, some working familiarity with Zoom, probably more than we want. Uh, but in case you are new to Zoom, uh, here's a couple of tips for you. You can move the talking heads. Uh, you probably see me somewhere in the upper right of your screen as I'm jabbering on. Uh, you can actually click that, move it around. This is especially important if there's something on a slide that you want to see that's being blocked. Uh, you can move that. If you want to ask a question, question to our presenter, Dr. Patricia Crown, please do that in the Q&A uh, button that you'll see. It's either going to be on that little drop down that comes down from the top of your screen or it might scroll up from the bottom. Um, there's a little thing that says Q&A. Use that for uh, questions about the substance of the talk. We'll take questions at the end. Uh, you can also use the chat function. That's a little bit more for uh, you know shout outs to friends, uh, just general conversation. If you're having difficulties with your Zoom feed, uh, you can head on over to our live stream that's at crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. That's on our Facebook feed. Uh, there is a live transcription service that's on here, so you might be seeing uh, text at the bottom of your screen, uh, closed captioning. The one thing I will note is that I think it struggles a lot with words that are not in English and with technical terminology out of archaeology. So if you see something on there that looks kind of funky, um, we don't actually have any control over it. It's just trying to read my voice and, and figure out how to transcribe the words coming out of my mouth. Um, be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, head on over there. We always say like and subscribe because the more followers we get, it unlocks different functions uh, in the YouTube um, in the YouTube page. Want to let you know about a couple upcoming webinars. Uh, we've got coming up next week, uh, Thursday, April fourteenth. We have multivocality in archaeology: the case study from the Mimbris Mugion region, and that's going to be with uh, a, a Crow Canyon Research Associate, si associate, and uh, I want to say past employee as well, Dr. Fumi Arakawa. That'll be at four p.m. Like all of our webinars. The following week, we'll have Lauren Aragon fashion designer and multimedia artist. Uh, so you can check that out Thursday, April 21st. Uh, so now we're going to turn towards uh, our actual presentation for the day. Uh, our presenter is Dr. Patricia Crown, who was educated at the University of Pennsylvania and University of Arizona. Uh, Dr. Crown is an archeologist who works in the US Southwest. 
She has been on the faculty at the University of New Mexico since 1993, where she is the Leslie Spear Distinguished Professor of Anthropology. She was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2014. Professor Crown has conducted field investigations in the ancestral Pueblo, Mogollon, and Hohokam areas of the American Southwest and has worked in Chaco Canyon since 2005. She is particularly interested in ritual, women's roles in the past, and how children learned the skills they needed to function as adults. To get at these issues, she studies ceramics. With collaborator Jeff Hurst, she identified the first pre-Hispanic cacao, that is uh, chocolate, north of the Mexican border and ceramics from Chaco Canyon using organic residue analysis. Absolutely fantastic and exciting stuff. I mean, that blew all of our minds. She directed the re-excavation of a room in Pueblo Benito, Chaco Canyon in 2013. And the results of that study were published in 2020 uh, by the UNM Press as a volume, The House of the Cylinder Jars, Room 28 at Pueblo Benito, Chaco Canyon. Uh, check it out here. I'd really recommend giving this a read. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Crown. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Crown. Thank you, Kellum, very much for that very nice introduction. Let me share my screen. Hopefully you can see that and yell at me if you can't. Um, just a second, I need to get some people out of my way. Okay, so before we get started, I want to acknowledge that my interpretations are based on my own understanding of the archeological record. Um, and that individuals from descendant communities may have different understandings of this record. At the time of the events described in this study around AD 1100, my ancestors lived in what is now Norway, farming and perhaps raiding and pillaging. So let's start with some background on room 28. Around August 10th of 1896, George Pepper and Richard Wetherill commenced excavations in room 28 of Pueblo Benito as part of the Hyde Exploring Expedition. The room is located on the northern side of Pueblo Benito, sandwiched between the West Court and what is called the Northern Burial Cluster. At first they found only burned roofing and thought about giving up. Then on August 20th, so 10 days into the excavation, a workman named Juan uncovered the first known Chacoan cylinder jar in room 28. Chaco cylinder jars are part of a long sequence of drinking vessel shapes used in Chaco. They were used at the same time as pitchers between around AD 875 and 1100. They have a very restricted distribution in the Southwest and they were made in sets of two to four identical jars. And this slide shows several sets, um, some with two jars, some with four jars. The one on the bottom has maker's marks on the bottom of the, jar, of the four jars that you see just above those bases. Organic residue analysis, as Kellum mentioned, shows that they were used to drink cacao or chocolate, which is, uh, comes from a tropical fruit that grows about 1,200 kilometers to the south in Mexico. Now, over the following nine days, so between August 20th and August 29th, uh, George Pepper and his workmen would find many more cylinder jars in room 28 along with numerous bowls and pitchers in a large pile on the western end of the room and in smaller groups in other parts of the room, eventually totaling 173 whole vessels. The room had burned and collapsed, burying the vessels with debris. Importantly, there were no burials or other human remains in the room. 
And this is true generally. Cylinder jars are almost never found accompanying burials, suggesting that they were not the property of individuals. In contrast, pitchers were common burial goods in Chaco. On August 29th, Pepper and Wetherill finished their work in the room and removed the masonry from a sealed doorway in the north wall of the room. And George Pepper entered room 32, adjacent room 32, and then adjacent room 33, the room with the two richest burials in Pueblo Benito. And this ended the excavation of room 28 in 1896. Importantly, room 28 had two stories, an early lower story that was only about eight square meters in size and a much larger upper story that spanned two lower rooms. When you're at Pueblo Benito today, you only see these latest rooms, but, but beneath, what you see on the surface are many earlier rooms. And I was primarily interested in the lower room that had held the cylinder jars. So here's the ground floor, the uh, lowest level of Pueblo Benito and of room 28. And then you can see the upper story walls above uh, where you see the pile of cylinder jars. While vessels were found throughout the room, the greatest mass of vessels were found in the western portion. And looking at all the photographs that were taken raised a number of questions. So moving on to what my questions were, um, one of them was, what was the wood surrounding the pots? George Pepper, when he excavated it, thought it was the burning roof of the lower room that fell on the vessels as it burned. But many of the vessels have big fire clouds on them from contact with burning wood. And my analysis and study of the photograph showed that they were mostly large fire clouds located on the underside of the vessels rather than the top. And in some cases in the photographs, you can see that the vessels are sitting on wood rather than the wood sitting on them as you would expect if the roof had fallen on them. In addition, in some of the photographs, there are pots like the ones that you see at the end of this arrow that seem to float on air rather than resting on the ground surface or leaning on anything else that you can identify. I also had a question about this sealed doorway that they opened up to reach adjacent room 32. If you look at the doorway, you can see that the the bottom of it is pretty much at the floor level. And Chaco doorways usually are located quite a bit above the floor. In some cases, they have to have a step to reach them. The, the doorways are so high. And so to have a doorway that seems to be pretty much at ground level seemed very unusual to me. And I had a question about whether or not this was actually the floor that they had reached or the floor might be deeper. And then finally, I had a question that was raised by the later excavations of the room next door. This is room numbered 28A. And when it was excavated, they recorded finding a floor and then finding a second floor several feet lower than the floor that they'd found in room 28 next door. Uh, and so again, that raised questions to me about whether they had ever reached the original floor in room 28. So here were my research questions. What was the sequence of construction, use, and abandonment of room 28? 
were the cylinder jars sitting on the lower story floor or had they fallen from an upper story floor when the room burned? And that if they'd fallen from an upper story floor, that would explain why there was wood underneath them. Did Pepper and Wetherill reach the earliest floor of the room in 1896? And then why were the vessels placed in room 28 and the room set on fire? Was this a reverential termination of the room or retirement of the room, or was it destructive? I thought we would find that the vessels had been sitting on an upper story floor when the room burned, that Pepper and Wetherill had never reached the actual floor of the room, that the door sills were above the floor rather than at floor level as seen in the photographs, and that there were even earlier floors under the first one that I thought they had never reached. So I proposed reopening the room to the National Park Service in, 20, in 2009. And the project went through a lengthy review project process that included consultation with 22 tribes, consultation with a group of archeologists, both in the park and outside the park, followed by a search for funding. And all of this process, which you see here, uh, involved four years. I was finally permitted to reopen the room and conduct some new work looking for earlier floors for a total of six weeks. Uh, which ended up being reduced to 22 days um, when we found human remains in the fill that had not been there in 1896. Um, so it was a very lengthy process and involved several separate uh, consultation events before the excavation, during the excavation, and then after the excavation. The room itself is located right on the trail and near the west courtyard in Pueblo Bonito. In Pueblo Bonito. Uh, so we had many visiting groups, including this one from Crow Canyon, and you may recognize some of the individuals in this slide. Okay, so what were our methods? Well, even though we were mostly excavating backfill, that had been removed and put back in the room in 1896, or so I thought. Um, the, we excavated it in levels, in 20 centimeter levels, and we screened everything. We screened 90% through quarter inch mesh and then 10% through eighth inch mesh until we got to lower levels and started finding lots of very small ornaments, and we switched to screening 100% through window screen mesh, which really slowed us down. Almost immediately, the walls became unstable, and the park had to put scaffolding up to hold them in place. I worked with an OSHA engineer from the University of New Mexico who came out and visited with us several times, and he would advise us on where to put scaffolding, whether it was safe to put ladders against the walls, and so on. You can see that we had to wear hard hats, mostly because we kept hitting our heads on the, um, the pipes that were part of the scaffolding. Um, ultimately, we ended up leaving one quadrant of the room unexcavated as stairs out of the room because there was no safe place to lean a ladder. And you can see in this slide the staircase down into the room, which required us to weave in and out of these poles with our buckets of dirt as we were taking them out to be screened. The fill included two completely different deposits. One, as you see here, was heavily burned with abundant chunks of charcoal, while the other had no burned material, but lots of unburned wood and chunks of masonry. And you can see that on the lower part of the slide. These two different 
types of fill appeared at the surface and continued almost to the floor. Um, out of the burn material, we took almost 1,800 pieces of charcoal for tree ring dating. Um, and we also found lots of burn daub or adobe as it's called, which was part of the ceiling and floor of the upper story. And this was the level that disappeared just above a few inches above the floor. This backfill, it turned out, came from adjacent room 28A, a room just to the east of room 28 that had burned as well. Uh, and you can see in this photograph, room 28A was excavated in 1897, so a year after room 28. And you can see that they're throwing the backfill into room 28, which is underneath that sloping mound of dirt at the top of the slide. The remaining fill was a discrete unit that extended from the surface to the floor. And you can see that it slants slightly from the southern part of the room to the northern part of the room, that it slopes downward. So it was being thrown from someplace to the north and filling up the room at this angle. We just didn't know really where it came from. And initially, I assumed they'd thrown the, the uh, back dirt from room 28 back into room 28, but that didn't turn out to be the case. We don't know where the back dirt from room 28 ended up, but it was definitely not in room 28. So this, the unburnt fill was really the big question. Where had this come from? And interestingly, it contained a number of cylinder jar fragments, almost exactly the same level that George Pepper first started finding cylinder jars in room 28. We started finding fragments of cylinder jars in room 28 as well in this fill. And so at night, while we were out at, at Pueblo Benito and working at night, I would sit with the sherds that we had found and try to match them up with my archive of photographs of all of the known cylinder jars from Pueblo Benito. And I was able to match them to vessels uh, that came from room 56, and 53, which are located to the north of room 28. So you can see them in this map outlined with red squares. And so the unburned backfill in room 28 came from these two rooms to the north. Now these rooms had been excavated and I, put that word in quotes uh, by an individual named Warren K. Moorhead. He had arrived at Pueblo Benito in April of 1897, just before Wetherill and Pepper returned in May. So a month before they were due to come back, he showed up and he had hired a number of farmers from Farmington, New Mexico, and they came down and basically looted these two rooms, tearing out walls, uh, looking for material, um, which they then took back and sold to Eastern museums or took to the Robert Peabody Museum in Massachusetts. Um, so, it turned out that in excavating room 28, we were not only finding about room 28, but we were also finding out about rooms 53, 56, and 28A. So we were essentially digging parts of four rooms rather than uh, one room. And 
I believe, uh, I have no way to prove this, but it seems most likely that the human remains that we found in the backfill, in the unburned backfill in room 28, came from rooms 53 and 56, which did in fact contain some burials. And we found isolated human remains in this unburned fill that had not been there in 1896, but now were there in 2013. These were, uh, at the end of the season, these were reburied at, um, in Chaco. Um, for the last five levels, we switched to window screen because we were finding high numbers of tiny turquoise jet and shell beads around 3,000 pieces along with mosaic fragments. And these two probably came from rooms 53 and 56 to the north. The floor of room 28 was easy to distinguish on the western end of the room because the fire had vitrified the sand and turned it to glass. So it, it's pretty easy to excavate a glass floor. Um, we had planned to subfloor, as I said previously, we only ended up having time to subfloor the southeastern quadrant of the room. And ultimately, my husband, Chip Wills, augured in part of it to sterile soil because we were running out of time. Okay, so what are the answers to my questions? Here's room. 28 in 1896 and what it looked like in 2013. We reached the floor surface where Pepper stopped excavating at 2.6 meters below the present ground surface. When we went deeper than the floor, we did not find any earlier floors this is what we found in that southeastern quadrant. You can see lots of lenses. These are not floors. These are probably outdoor activity surfaces like a plaza surface where people were doing various activities outside adjacent to rooms that were located to the east of room 28. These surfaces date between AD 650 and 880 to 900, something like that. The little holes that you see here are a pollen column that we took and analyzed. And there's good evidence for lots of food processing and crafts production in this area on these little surfaces that accumulated over time. At the level that they started building room 28, we see impressions of splinters of wood around post holes, uh, which show the level at which the room was constructed. We took lots of dates for AMS dating, and these confirm that the uh, room was constructed in the late 800s, like around 880, or the very early 900s. And the tree ring date suggests the same thing. We didn't, we, although we took so much wood for tree ring dating, we got very few dates. The presence of, of several informal fire pits at the floor level suggests that the room was initially used as a domestic space. And then around 1040, a new north wall was constructed. So the old one was taken down and a new north wall constructed of what Chaco and archeologists call type two masonry. And what is called a room wide shelf was constructed running north-south across the room. And in this slide, you can see two sockets for that room-wide shelf. They're little, almost like portholes in the wall that the beams for this room-wide shelf could be socketed into. On the south wall, the beam was surrounded by 
thick plaster to hold it in place. And the shelf was, the, the plaster rather, was tamped into place by an individual with six toes on their left foot. And there, <laughs> the very last day we were out there, I was desperately trying to find some way to get an impression of this footprint. And all I could find in Farmington, New Mexico was Play-Doh. And so what you see on the right is a Play-Doh impression of that six-toed foot. Uh, other footprints, rock art, artifacts, and human remains indicate that polydactyly or having more than five toes was highly valued at Pueblo Benito. And the, what we found in room 28 with the six-toed impression on the wall just adds to that information on how there were individuals with polydactyly of Pueblo Benito and that seems to have been a valued trait. Now, by 1040, when this room-wide shelf was put in the room, the dynamic environment surrounding Pueblo Benito had raised the west courtyard level so that room 28 was no longer at ground level. Now it was an underground room. It and the adjacent rooms that you see in this uh, map were all completely underground and apparently mostly used for storage after this time. To reach the room, a stairway was built leading from underground room 28 up to the West Court. And then around 1070, an upper story was added to room 28 uh, that covered both room 28 and adjacent room 28A. Twin T-shaped doorways leading to the West Court were built into that upper story. Unfortunately, they were later filled in, so it's difficult to see them in this slide. And then you can see the masonry outline of the stairway down to lower room 28. Then around AD 1100, individuals, uh, perhaps ritual specialists, closed the doorway between room 28 and room 32 to the north. So they blocked it completely with masonry. As well as perhaps the doorway to the west court. In this slide, you can see a sandstone slab in that stairway down to room 28. And it looks like it was um, uh, probably to seal that doorway. The individuals then sprinkled hundreds of turquoise and shell ornaments on the stairway. 127 ceramic vessels were placed on the shelving, with others placed blocking the east doorway and on the upper story floor. Thousands of ornaments were sprinkled over and placed in the vessels. Here you can see hundreds of turquoise shell, jet, and shale ornaments and tesserae or mosaic pieces that we found at the floor level in room 28. They then placed fire around the post under the, shel the room-wide shelving and lit it on fire. And you can see the very red and heavily burned area around that post hole where the fire was first started. That's where the floor vitrified and turned to glass. The fire burned so hot, it vitrified the floor and burned most of the planks from the shelving. This was a termination or retirement of the room and its contents. The fact that so many ornaments were sprinkled there suggests that it was a reverential, respectful termination rather than merely destructive. It probably, this, this retirement 
probably was particularly associated with the cylinder jars, a practice associated with beliefs concerning animism, that the vessels were living spirits that held power that had to be destroyed and released through burning. Eventually, the upper story collapsed, smothering the fire. Room 28 was one of only several rooms that seemed to have been burned at the same time in this part of Pueblo Benito. At some point, the debris uh, was leveled and a wall built at the upper story and a plaster surface laid. Um, I have suggested that it might have been used as a turkey pen because we found lots of evidence for Turkey in room 28, including eggshell fragments, gullet stones, and turkey bones. So what have we done since 2013? We've analyzed all the artifacts that we recovered in 2013, including uh, all the chipstone, groundstone, ornaments, ceramics, textiles, and plaster. We analyzed all the museum artifacts from room 28 that are curated at the American Museum of Natural History and the National Museum of the American Indian. We analyzed the fauna, macrobotanical samples and pollen samples, as well as eggshell and gullet stones. Uh, we did stable isotope analysis with a sample of the fauna uh, going through an, an additional consultation with the 22 tribes in order to do that research. Uh, we had the dendro samples dated at the tree ring lab in Tucson and additional samples were analyzed for AMS dating in Tucson as well. And then we completed an edited volume on the excavations and the results, along with five articles and a, a Society for American Archaeology session. I personally spent a lot of time with the ceramics, particularly refitting portions of the vessels from sherds found in the backfill, and then comparing the sherds to those at the museums. Once I figured out that they had come from rooms 53 and 56, I particularly focused on uh, the museum collections from those rooms and trying to refit what we found in 2013 with what had been found there in 1897. Uh, museums did not want me bringing sherds to their, <laughs> to their museums. Uh, for some reason, and so I ended up using photographs on my computer screen in the museums and then the actual museum collections and trying to match them up. So here I am at the American Museum of Natural History fitting portions of a cylinder jar uh, that is seen on the screen with sherds that are in their collections from rooms 53 and 56. And here is another vessel. The one on the screen is from the uh, 2013 excavation and the one in my hand is from 1897. This showed how widely both pottery and human remains had been scattered from rooms 53 and 56 when these were excavated in 1897 by Warren K. Moorhead and the group of farmers he hired in Farmington. The work with the human remains from 53 and 56 was done by Carrie Ann Marden. I have not personally done that research, but she was able to show that the, those uh, human remains were widely scattered over a number of rooms, as you see in this slide, the, the blue kind of shaded area. And then the red arrows are the ceramics that I was able to refit that came from a number of rooms. Uh, I was able to find that there had been at least 12 previously unknown cylinder jars um, that ended up in the backfill in 2013, but probably originally were from rooms 53 and 56. And then more had just plowed through. 
Okay, so let's return to my original expectations and see how well I did. And then you can grade me on my ability in predicting what it is I'm looking at before I did the excavation. So I thought that the vessels probably had been sitting on the upper story and I was wrong about that. They were not, Pepper was right. They were found associated with lower story room 28, but they had been sitting on a room wide platform or shelving. And that was why there was wood and evidence for burning underneath them. I thought that Pepper had never reached the original floor and I was wrong about that as well. I thought the door sills would be found above the floor and I was wrong about that as well. And then I thought there would be earlier floors as there were in adjacent room 28A and I was wrong about that as well. So I would give me probably a D minus on my predictive abilities. Most importantly, we found that the cylinder jars were associated with drinking, that had been associated with drinking chocolate at Pueblo Benito, had been stored on a shelf in room 28, built around AD 1040, and then terminated around AD 1100. Was this the end of chocolate consumption in Pueblo Benito, the death of the last principal ritual practitioner, a change in the use of cylinder jars for drinking chocolate, the end of a ritual cycle, or the abandonment of Pueblo Benito for some period of time. Uh, this termination ritual does seem to have ended the use of cylinder jars in drinking chocolate in Chaco Canyon, but evidence suggests that the drinking of chocolate continued, but instead shifted to mugs. As to why they were terminated at that time, we don't know. Uh, what I am fairly certain of was that the room was the property of a ritual group of some kind, that the vessels were not the property of individuals, but were owned by a group, what anthropologists call a ritual sodality, and that the destruction of the room was a reverential termination of the use of these jars uh, at the end of their use in Chaco Canyon. But chocolate continued to be consumed. It just shifted to uh, consumption in mugs. And interestingly, when Clayt Weatherill opened that closed doorway from room 28 into adjacent room 32, just inside the room sat several mugs, the drinking vessel that replaced the cylinder jar. Thank you. Well, Dr. Crown, that was uh, that was fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Maybe we can uh, stop the screen share so people can see me, see you, and we can work our way through some of these questions. Sounds good. Um, let's see. Let's start with a couple uh, that are uh, related to things earlier in, in the talk. That'll give us some background for later ones. Uh, Margaret Guilfoyle was wondering, when you were looking at those, uh, those lenses that maybe were uh, part of a plaza space, what type of food production was discovered there? You were mentioning food production evidence, so. Uh, we found a lot of corn pollen um, on every level as well as some um, If I'm remembering correctly, we found portions of corn cobs as well. Karen Adams, if she happens to be on this, can probably remember better than I did all of the details since she did our macrobotanical analysis. Uh, but the pollen also showed 
fantastically high amounts of cattail pollen, which mm. either had to have been introduced as a uh, ritual um, pollen or it's um, cattail is sometimes used in making plaster as a thickener for plaster. And so it's possible that it was brought in. It's interesting because you don't think of Chaco as having a lot of cattail, but uh, in fact, there are portions that are uh, swampy. <laughs> so probably the wrong term, but have enough water that you do have cattail growing. Um, okay. I remember being really surprised when I was working out at Padilla Wash that there were these little seeps and springs that probably would have been sufficient for supporting small, small amounts of cattails. So uh, very cool that you found evidence there. Um, here's a question from Frank Grenier, and it's about the, the small uh, turquoise tiles for mosaics that you found. And they, uh, he was wondering what kind of mosaics would people have been making with those? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, the, the, one that you may be familiar with that um, is, is really a fantastic object is a, a basket that's covered. It's a cylinder basket. So it looks like a cylinder jar, but it's basketry and it's covered with turquoise mosaics. Um, apart from that, whatever was the backing, uh, probably has not survived very well. The, it, uh, the mosaics might have been used on uh, shell backings or wooden backings. Um, they have found some wood at Pueblo Benito that has some pieces of turquoise attached to it. Uh, so that's a possibility. It's not really my area of expertise, but... Um, we do know that there, there were uh, baskets, wood, and perhaps shell that might have been used as backing for mosaic. Hmm. Um, well, thanks for, thanks for clearing that up. I had one other kind of basic question here, and then I'm going to move into some that are more specific to the cylinder jars themselves. Uh, some folks just wanted to clarify what's your what's your take on the date that the room was ritually terminated. Uh, I know you said it just to clarify. I I believe it was around AD eleven hundred, but that's based on absence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's always risky in archaeology to base anything on absence, but it's an absence of ceramics that in the room that would post date around 1100 and it's an absence of any date dates uh, that would that seem to post date 1100 so there's a certain amount of squishiness there it could be 1115 could be 1095 but it's somewhere around 1100 okay thank you um Here's a question about residues within uh, the cylinder jars. And has anybody looked into those to see if there's any chili residue, like, uh, like chili peppers? Um, not that I know of. We had discussed looking and had planned to do more work with what the additives were in the um, cylinder jars. Uh, and then, ended up getting sidetracked and didn't follow up on that. Um, residue analysis can be more complicated than I realized. It's, it's not like compositional analysis with um, mm -hmm. clay. It's way more complicated. And so uh, although I had hoped to do more with what the additives were in the, in the chocolate, uh, we haven't really followed up on that yet. It may still happen, but it hasn't. One of the things to recognize about room 28 was that the fire was pretty hot. And so those vessels that are actually in room 28 probably don't have much in the way of residues remaining at all. 
um, but adjacent rooms that had cylinder jars did not burn. And so those rooms have provided more evidence for chocolate residues in cylinder jars than room 28 itself. Well, well then this next question might pertain more to those, uh, those particular cylinder vessels. And is, is there any evidence that these are being cleaned out after each use or is the fact that you can still identify residue on them because they weren't getting cleaned regularly? That's a really good question. Um, and here's two answers. One is that there are uh, use wear marks on many of the cylinder jars that I call scrubbing marks and they appear as little scratches mostly on the exterior of the jars that make it clear that something was being cleansed off of them. I call them scrubbing marks because it looks like somebody was picking up a handful of wet sand and using it to scrub the outside. And my research with the cylinder jars generally, and I've looked at almost every single cylinder jar in a museum in the United States from Chaco, um, is that some of them have little bits of plaster on them. So I think of one time that they had a plaster coating and then brightly colored pigment on them and that would be cleansed. It would be put on before an event and cleansed off after an event. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the second answer to this question is that uh, the residues that in my study that we're looking at, and this isn't how everybody does it, but it's the way I've done residue analysis, is that we take about a dime-sized portion and we use a Dremel tool with a tungsten carbide bit that has been sterilized and we burr off all of the exterior and then we grind up the interior of the sherd and analyze that. So we're actually looking at absorbed residues, not residues that you would wash off but resid or, or even see, but residues that you would, uh, that would be inside of this relatively soft uh, ceramic paste. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, very cool. Um, I'm gonna shift now to some mug questions. Uh -oh. um, which is, this one's actually coming from Mark Varian, who's probably like three doors down for me at the moment. Uh, when do you think mugs were first made in large numbers and do they appear at Chaco earlier than they do in the Mesa Verde region uh, where they're, they're pretty common up here, at least in the, the Pueblo three period. Um, Mark says, it seems the use of cylinder jars was, was restricted to specific groups while mugs are a bit more widespread um, and just wondering if you have any thoughts on this. Where did they show up first? And is there differences in their use and restriction to certain groups? Okay, so I'm gonna have a little chat with you, Mark Barry. <laughs> I remember Mark when he was a grad student, so I can talk to him that way. Um, so um, you guys know a lot more about mugs than I do. Here's what I know about mugs in Chaco. And the, the person who knows the most about mugs, I think is Katie Putsavage, who did her um, dissertation on mugs and really knows a lot about them. But in Chaco, they really don't appear until sometime in the early 1100s. And there aren't that many of them. There are some, I have tried to look at them. There aren't a tremendous number but there are some and they do seem to be individual drinking vessels uh, and they do occur with burials. So there doesn't seem to be the same restriction that we see with the cylinder jars and they do seem to belong to individuals rather than belonging to a group. The thing with the cylinder jars is that they're so concentrated in just a few rooms they're not associated with individual burials, um, and they mostly seem to have been stored by the uh, what I think were ritual sodalities or lineages, clans, um, and belonged to them, and then were distributed for these events. 
with the mugs, it seems to be a very different situation. They're much more like pitchers, which were individual drinking vessels. Okay. Hopefully that answered it, Mark. And if it doesn't, talk. I'll have to, I'll catch up with him tomorrow and find out. And if not, he can bug you with an email or something, <laughs> I suppose. Um, have, I, I'm going to try to, we've, we've got, well, right now there's 27 questions and I, I apologize. I'm certainly not going to get to all of them. Um, because we've got to let Dr. Crown uh, off, off of this webinar at some point. But I'll try to wrap up a couple of them in one bigger question here. Well, two bigger questions. And part of that is understanding the distribution of cylinder vessels within the Chacoan world. Um, and also, are there earlier inspirations for cylinder vessels in other regions outside the Southwest? And then also to get a little bit better sense of how is cacao making its way up to Chaco Canyon and are people in Chaco using this in some way that's similar to Mesoamerica? I can break that down again if you want. Sorry, I, I see you putting your hands okay, in your face. Okay, so in Tell four minutes, what done. <laughs> I'm going to try to cover, cover thousands of years in four minutes. Okay, so um, cylinder jars. Uh, there are cylinder vessels in other parts of the Southwest. There are cylinder vessels in um, the whole Calm area. There are cylinder vessels. Actually, the earliest ones are found in Colorado. Um, so they're not um, just found in Chaco Canyon. And the inspiration for them may have, it may have been independent invention. It's not like that cylinder shape is so very, very unusual. Some people, um, Scott Ortman, for instance, had suggested that it's similar to a Kiva. And so that, that kind of cylinder shape may just have been something that a number of people thought of. One of the interesting things about the cylinder jars in Chaco is that they are so concentrated in Chaco. So there are, some are actually made outside Chaco. There's some that come from even what may be the Mogollon area or at least the um, upper little Colorado area. And there are some that come from um, the Chuska area, but they come into Chaco and they are deposited there. We don't see them being used in those outside areas. Instead, they seem to be brought into Chaco and then used in Chaco and ultimately uh, retired in Chaco. So that's part of the question. Then question about cacao. We do not know exactly how cacao got to Chaco. We know just logically that either people from Chaco went south and got it people from the South brought it up to Chaco or it was passed village to village, hand to hand. And I think over time, it could well be that it was all of those things, that it was people from Chaco went South and got it, people from the South brought it up and that it went hand to hand and got into Chaco. I don't think that they were getting the actual pods. I don't think that they were getting the nibs. I think that they were probably getting um, prepared cakes, which, and by cake, I mean they look like hockey pucks, but they're, they're uh, processed to the point where it would be fairly simple to make a chocolate drink out of them. Does that cover I, the questions? I think that kind of covers a lot of bases there, and hopefully, hopefully everybody got what they wanted out of that one. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one more here. Let me, let me look through and see what's going to what, what's going to cover this? Oh, um, let's see. One of the rooms, classmates. Here's a short amount of time. Um, let's. I. I would. Here's one more that hopefully doesn't get too involved. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to wrap up a couple in in one question, but could you speak a little bit more to the notion of these vessels and animism, how they may have been kind of inalienable possessions that were thought of in, in 
ways that we don't today think about objects and how that may have played into the decision to terminate this room with all these vessels in it? Well, I think that the vessels were considered to have to be um, uh, insold or to have um, a, at least a spark of life in them. And that because they were animated objects, that it was important to release that living power when they were going to no longer be used. So burning the room that they were stored in, the vessels itself, would then transfer that power into smoke that would rise and return to the universe. That's a, a very simplistic kind of description of, of what I think was going on. But again, it's not it is not my culture. And so this is just what I surmise from talking with people, uh, reading texts, um, trying to understand why uh, this kind of destruction would occur. And very similar things were done in Mesoamerica among the Maya, for instance, it was quite common to terminate and to burn objects, um, burn rooms and the, the power from them that would then sort of return to the universe in the same way. So it's not unique in Chaco and it, it seems to be a, an important and, and respectful way to end something. Oh, I think that that's a very succinct description of what's going on there. It's complicated stuff translating between different cultures and Sometimes the idea of ritual is so incommensurate with our idea of religion, it's, it's really tough to, to get at that. But uh, that was, I really liked that your description of that. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions. And Dr. Crown, I just wanted to let you know that there are thank yous and fantastic pre presentations are just flowing in on the chat. I don't know if you can see those, but people have really enjoyed what you've shared with us uh, here today. Uh, and I really appreciate you coming on to our webinar series and presenting this. It's been fantastic. So, so thank you so much, Dr. Crown. Thank um, you. I think we are going to sign off now. Don't forget to come back and, and catch us next week with Dr. Fumi Arakawa. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Crown.